do have the honor to invite uh, the famous, uh, one of the pioneers in 3D printing, Professor Chai Ji Kai, uh, to come to vis visit us and uh, give a, I think it would be one for seminar report about 3D printing. And uh, currently he's uh, associate uh, provost in uh, SUTT, Singapore University of uh, Design and Technology. Before he was the chair of the Department of Nanyang Technical University. Yeah, uh, mechanical engineer, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, he also chair professor in that department. And uh, yeah, he's also the creator of many famous, or we say top round, <laughs> yeah, journals, the VPP, Virtual and Physical Prototyping and Journal, the Chief Editor, and also International Journal of Bioprinting uh, Journal. And uh, last year, or two years ago, we launched another new uh, uh, journal. <laughs> it's a uh, Material science uh, yeah, in IT marketing, right? So I think IT marketing yeah, need this kind of journal. And today uh, he will bring us uh, quite interesting uh, re uh, seminar reports about IT marketing and what is the future yeah, for that. So yeah, enjoy. And uh, later, if you have any questions, just uh, feel free to pose a question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chang. Thanks for coming to my talk. People are still streaming in. I hope you had a good lunch. It's always hard to give a talk after lunch, right, lecturers? <laughs> so um, I'm glad to see that you made your precious time here. I come from Singapore. We normally don't experience this kind of weather. Neither do I have to wear this coat. <laughs> How many of you have been to Singapore before? One? Oh, at least one, good. <laughs> Two, okay. Oh, oh, not too far away, <laughs> our northern neighbour. So Singapore, as you know, is uh, in the tropics. Really, that's one degree above the equator. So all year round, is the same temperature, <laughs> summer. The only difference is whether you have rain or don't have rain. And today you have rain here. Our rain is a lot heavier than this. <laughs> so greetings from Singapore. I come from a very small university called Singapore University of Technology and Design was set up only about 15 years ago, very small, very boutique, very niche, only have engineering and architecture. So um, it's my privilege to be here. Um, I have brought my researcher, Victoria, with, so she's with me today. So later maybe she will share a bit of the work she's doing uh, with me. So I hope to share about an hour of my talk on what you can expect from additive manufacturing, which is the official terminology used for 3D printing. Uh, while ASTM has classified as additive manufacturing, man, many people still use the word 3D printing, something that's more intuitive, um, and the role it can play in the future of the economy. It will remain to be very important, at least for the next 20, 30 years. There are still many things we do not know about 3D printing. so. PhD students, don't worry, your future is bright. <laughs> it's an area that you will have lots of things to do, not only in academia, but also in industry. So I hope to share. So this will be my program outline. i share a little bit about SUTD. It's a very young university, and I can share with you uh, what we plan to do in this university, very differently from other universities. Uh, about myself, then I will share a little bit about 3D printing. How many of you know something about 3D printing? All of them. Wow, good, good. Okay, great. Today, I will talk about my 34 years of experience in one hour. <laughs> I, print, I printed practically everything. Uh, and then I will share about what you can expect from 3D printing. And of course, we will look into a crystal ball of what you can see uh, tomorrow. There will be many things to share, so some parts I will keep it short. Yeah, because trends itself, I have 11 trends. I only cover two. <laughs> yeah, this is to make sure he'll invite me back again. <laughs> All right, about SUTD. Uh, it is the fourth university set up by the government. So Singapore is very small, as you know. So as of today, I think we have only seven public universities. How many does France have public universities? In France, how many? Countless. <laughs> Thousands. <laughs> yeah, that's why we are so small, we are only seven. So SUTD was the fourth to be set up, and it's only about 15 years old. 
So when we set up, our Prime Minister Lee gave us the challenge, you must not copy the existing universities. You cannot be a copycat. You cannot be a mini NTU or anywhere. If you're familiar with Singapore, the two good universities before us are NTU and NUS. I was from NTU. In fact, I spent 30, 34 years at NTU. Though I look very young, right? <laughs> I'm not that young anymore. Um, so I joined uh, SUTD four years ago, but in 2010, our Prime Minister of Singapore actually gave us a challenge. We want to provide high quality education. The key thing about university education is actually what? Our products, our graduates, right? If you graduate them and they have no jobs, you are in trouble. <laughs> so it must be a very unique pedagogy. You'll find that in many of the top universities, uh, they chase after ranking. Our Prime Minister say, don't chase after ranking. So in my previous university, NTU, we chased a lot after ranking. So it's quite a different ball game altogether. And what we wanted to do is to make sure that we train our students to be resilient, to be really useful. And that's why when we formulated our uh, curriculum, it's very unique. I'll share in a short while. So because we are new, whenever you are new, you are competing with the NUS and NTU. How do you compete? Parents will send their children to the world-class universities, right? Why would they send to a university that's unproven, right? So our challenge was, how do we start? Therefore, we bring in our good partner, MIT. It was very important to have the MIT brand name. In fact, 95% of our curriculum was imported from MIT. So MIT was with us, uh, and we bring in the MIT uh, DNA. We also partner with Zhejiang University, a very good university in China. So these were the East and the West University that uh, work with us. And this is our international uh, partner network. And in fact, after a number of years, when MIT did an independent survey, among all the new emerging engineering schools, we came up top. And it's because of our very unique pedagogy. So I will just share one or two things why we are different. Firstly, when we have the courses, we don't call our courses mechanical engineering, electrical, because we feel that what are we going to produce are people who will go out to the industry. So we look at what the industry do. So for instance, a company like Dyson, or for that matter, any of the French company, what do they want? They want products, they make products. So it's very important for us to have a degree program on engineering product development. So when I was head, I joined four years ago, I looked after the pillar, it was on engineering product development. Therefore, if you teach the students in engineering product development, you'll find that you cannot just teach them one discipline, right? You teach them mechanical engineering, but you look at a handphone, it has electronics, it has materials, it has manufacturing. So you must be holistic in the way you approach. So we started with only four major degree programs, engineering product development for products, uh, engineering systems and design, which is for big systems of systems. Uh, third one is on software, so it's computer science. And the fourth one is built environment for architecture, only four. So like I've said, we are very small, very boutique, very niche, small, but we focus on output. What is it that the world wants? We produce graduates that the world wants. So the way we uh, structure ourselves, the way we teach our curriculum, very different from the usual NTU and anywhere. So we try to be different. Yeah, the good news for us is in the recent years, they are all copying us. <laughs> Which means we are onto the right formula. Interdisciplinary from the onset. Our students are all trained in that. I will stop here because that will take one hour to just talk about SUTD. I want to share more about 3D printing. That, that's the purpose of my talk today. Uh, before I do that, uh, let me do a bit of commercial. <laughs> I've been in this field for 34 years. I bought my first printer in 1990. I know some of these guys are not born yet. My first printer I bought was SLA, half a million dollars from 3D Systems, 1990. For what? Printing of jewelry. In 1990, I got a grant, was to help the industry in jewelry. Because those days, it was very craft-based. They used a lot of hands. They don't use automation. So we wanted to change that for the industry. So that began my journey 34 years ago. But in the last 34 years, I've printed a lot of things, which I brought some here. Uh, so. As academic, you know, we publish papers. So publish a lot of papers. Uh, 
lots of citations, the usual things uh, that most of us as academics do. And uh, this is my passion. So I've done a lot of training. I've trained thousands of people from as far as Mexico. They send professors, they come and take my course. So I train thousands of people from all over the world. I have also been consulted by many companies. Companies are very keen to go into this technology. So they will come because they want to make money. Right? So they want to know what can they print to make money. So you, of course, make some money from them as well. Then you teach them how to do it. So I've been consulted. So uh, I think you can read Chinese, right? <laughs> Tian Xia Ti. Uh, this is not meant to be a boast. It is based on real numbers, objective data. From Clarivet Insight, you can see there's one area called additive manufacturing. You use that area to search. I'm the world most published and most cited. Okay, so that's my credential. Uh, happy to be number one. Tian Xia Ti. So those are numbers. And uh, this is uh, what I won. Um, in fact, when I won it in the 10th time, I guess I'm the only one from Asia who has won it. <laughs> uh, I have published more than 10 books. My first book actually was my first edition. This is the fifth edition. I published the first edition in 1997. It was called It was called Rapid Prototyping. In the first 10 years, the technology was not called 3D printing. It was called Rapid Prototyping. That was my first book. But over the years, I've written five editions that have changed the name. Uh, I published other books also in laser. When I published this book in bioprinting, it was the first in the world. Some of my books have been translated into Taiwanese. Uh, there is the Fan Ti Zi, Jian Ti Zi in Beijing, and also now Korean. Yeah. So very happy that uh, people are using my books in those countries. Um, my latest book is on our favorite subject, food. <laughs> So that was my latest book, and uh, I would like to present uh, a book to Professor Chang. This is my latest book. So next time he has to print French cuisine. You get him to print, okay? <laughs> So in my book, I've uh, done quite a lot of uh, Singaporean snacks, 3D printed. Yeah. Later, I'll share why we print food. So that's my latest. Uh, and then just before that, I've done a lot on electronics as well, very key area. So these are two of the very hot topics today. So this is my latest book, and only book that has a forward by our Minister for Health, Mr. Ong, and give us a very nice complimentary remarks about our work. So because uh, some of the work we do is for healthcare, and he's the Minister for Health. We print quite a lot of work for uh, old folks' home, you know, those homes, nursing homes, they need this kind of food. Uh, Victoria is my money person, trying to get money investments, <laughs> going down to the nursing home to do test bathing. She will share a bit later. Um, this might be of interest to those of you researchers, PhD students who are doing research in this area. My first journal I started with Taylor Francis was 2006. Today it is probably very matured. Um, good news is uh, every year since the first year, it has impact factor has always been Q1. So 10.6. Last year there was a little dip. I realized once you reach 10, it's very hard to go higher. <laughs> very tough. Uh, I think this coming July it should be still above 10, but very hard to break the 11. IJB is a journal that I focus on bioprinting. Uh, started much later in 2015, but very quickly, within five years, I got an impact factor. And uh, good news is it has remained a Q1. Then two years ago, I started a new one called Material Science in AM. I look at the landscape. There wasn't a single journal. AM, there are about now about maybe 20, but none devoted to material science. And I think it's important. Right? You print polymer, you print metal and all that. Materials is key to getting the kind of properties that you need for industry application. So I started this journal two years ago. As a new journal, you have to be patient, you have to wait. So I hope you'll get into ESCI this year and maybe another year or two SCI and hopefully Q1. I believe in quality. So I welcome your submission, guys. Got good papers, let me know. Rejection rate very high. <laughs> I warn you first. 
VPP has a rejection rate of 90%. <laughs> so no choice, we have to ensure the quality. All right, let me share about 3D printing. Um, when this idea of 3D printing came out, uh, people was looking around all the manufacturing uh, fabricators. A machine that makes things, there are actually three kinds of fabricators. First, formative, uh, think of injection molding, that's formative. Then, subtractive, CNC, all your milling, turning, all these are processes that remove material. Then came about additive manufacturing. This came about, the first commercial printer was 1988. So we are talking about not very long ago, 30 odd years. Not like CNC, is 1951. So it's about 70 years old. So 3D printing has still a long way to go. Okay. So the whole idea is to add. And we had a very nice discussion this morning, right? Layer by layer is too slow. <laughs> Come up with some nice ideas. You, you become uh, famous. Yeah? Uh, a method maybe by volume or by curve or by... Just don't do it by layer. <laughs> maybe you find a better way. But this is currently the technology. Things are done layer by layer. I have a little toy here. So the whole idea of 3D printing really is layer by layer. So I think I have a slide. There you are. So think of it, if you can use a machine to make things a section at a time or a layer at a time, then you can find a way to join this layer. You have a 3D printing method. So this is just as simple as it is. Things are made layer by layer. So every layer is your X and Y. When you have the Z, you get three-dimensional. Everything you see around us, from the building to the human body, we are all three-dimensional, right? So it can be just as plain as that. But there are many ways to define 3D printing. Uh, the way I define in my book is by the raw material form. It can come in liquid form, uh, solid base, or powder. And you say your PhD work was based on liquid, right? You try to do it with water. So there are three forms, but there are actually many ways you can classify. But ASTM has decided to classify it by ASTM standard. So the standard is seven types. Some of you, uh, some of it, I've seen it in your labs uh, today. Um, I think I've used practically all of them. <laughs> okay. So let's start from the top. The first one, uh, where's the? Okay, never mind. So the first one is binder jacketing. Binder jacketing was actually invite, uh, invented by MIT. The professor basically took a simple 2D printer, the cartridge which has ink, removed the ink, put in binder. Instead of an A4 paper, they put powder. So as the printhead goes across the powder bed, it puts out small little droplets of binder. What does the binder do? It joins the powder together. And then when you join this powder together, you have one layer. You add another layer of powder, you join again. And that's how you get your three-dimensional part. Binder jacketing, that's how it was started in, the 19, in 1996 by MIT. So that's binder jacketing. Directed energy deposition is something that came in much later. Um, the whole idea is using some kind of a nozzle and you can spray. So it's deposition, you can spray the metal, usually it's metal, metal powder into a layer by layer. Now, how do you join these powder particles together? They use energy. So in this form of energy, you can either use a laser, you can use an electron beam. Some people just use, a, it's a kind of a welding process. So the whole idea was to use heat to melt and fuse the powder together. So directed energy deposition is actually a competitor to powder bed fusion. There are pros and cons. Let me talk about material extrusion. This is the world most common. Why? Why is it the world most common? I'm sure most of you have used uh, material extrusion. Why was it the most world most common? Because it was the first to have its patent expired. <laughs> most of the technologies that were patented in the 1980s, 1990s. So FDM was the first. And therefore, everybody built FDMs. I actually also had a company that spin off uh, FDM. But I'm still here today, you know, it means that I've caught, I've not made any money. <laughs> so FDMs are a plenty. Alti maker, you can name, there are thousands out there. You go Taobao, you can buy one for below $1,000, right? It's very cheap now. So FDM, basically, uh, most of it by filament. The whole idea is the filament goes into a pre-net, you use heat, you, 
melt the filament, but not too liquid, just making it soft so that when it's extruded through the orifice, it cools, it solidifies, and that's how you build a layer at a time. Um, I actually do a lot of uh, food printing using bacterial extrusion. Material jacketing, uh, you have it in your lab as well, your stratasys. So polyjack is one of them. 3 d system also has one called Project, similar name. The whole idea is jetting. So what comes out is small little droplets of liquid, but when it comes out, there is a flash of light. All these liquids are photopolymers. When there's a flash of light, it polymerizes, so it solidifies, and that's how you get a layer of time. Very nice printer, but it's a closed system. It's very expensive. Okay, Every printer has got its pros and cons. That's why until today, they are still around. Those that don't have all the merits plus still expensive, they'll be out. After some time, they'll be out of business. Uh, powder bed fusion today is very popular. It can be used for both polymer and metal. The whole idea is to use very small grains of powder, plastic or metal, and then subject them to heat. After which, they sinter and they join together. So I've used this the most uh, uh, in my research. So uh, very popular now today for metal. VAT polymerization was world first, 1988, SLA. So basically, it's a VAT. You have point your liquid. Every layer is cured by your laser. Actually, the photopolymer, you put it under sunlight, under exposure of UV light, it cures as well. So using laser, you can directly dis decide where you want to cure your liquid into solid. So that was the first. And then the last is sheet lamination. Anyone knows about sheet lamination? No? Nobody knows here? Okay. Boy, I give you an apple. <laughs> this apple is made by this method, sheet lamination. Do you know what this material is? Paper, precisely. You can feel it, but please don't eat it. Uh, it's the paper. This apple is made of paper. In fact, I, I used to have another one, which is a hammer. And you look at hammer, because it can do color, it looks just like a hammer. And when I hit it on the table, it sounds just like metal head. But it's actually all paper. Why didn't I bring it? Because I got stopped at the custom in one of my trips. They thought I have a weapon in my bag. So they stopped me in Singapore, they stopped me in Beijing. So I decided I don't bring. <laughs> Too dangerous to get stopped. Yeah. So it's interesting. It's actually pieces of A4 paper. Standard A4 paper, nothing special about the paper. Can you believe it? It's just layers of paper. So the paper are then cut. You can use a paper cutter or you can use laser to cut it. You just cut the profile. If it's apple, this is the shape, it's up the top, it's smaller, right? So you can cut. And each layer of paper is glued to the previous layer. And that's how you stack them up together. Now, question How do you get a color into the apple? How do you make color? Okay, now it's quiz time. Eh? Is the color added before the cutting and gluing, or during the cutting and gluing, or after? A, B, or C? You can choose D. D means you don't know. Okay? A, before. Nobody. B, during. Okay, quite a lot. C, after. A few. D. <laughs> huh? Okay. This particular method was uh, invented by uh, a pair of brothers from uh, Scotland. The method of adding color is very simple. You won't believe it. It's before. So, at the top of the machine is where they the, do the cutting and gluing, right? But before it even starts that, at the bottom of the printer is a Epson color printer. <laughs> the normal 2D printer that you have on your desk. So what it does, it takes your stack of paper. So if your apple is this high, right? Your stack of A4 paper is this high. It just prints duplex, both sides. What do you need to print? Just the external, because you can't see what's inside, right? Only the external. So you just print the color of the apple, the external profile. Finish. Then the whole stack of paper go up to the top of the printer and starts cutting and gluing. So it's before. But this method is not popular. Do you know why? It generates a lot of waste. When you finish, you take it out, what do you have? 
you have a stack of paper, the height of your apple, your apple is this, but your A4 is this, what happens to the rest? Waste. So it's not good for sustainability, <laughs> something that is so hot today, right? So this method, until today, is not popular. In fact, this is not new. Some, uh, about two decades ago, there was a company called Cubita, uh, that not Cubita, um, forgot the name, uh, Helicis. It's a technique called LOM, Laminated Object Manufacturing. That one, no colour. They, they were around for a time. After a while also, they collapsed because it's just a lot of waste. We use 3D printing because we want to save materials, not generate more waste, right? So this is not popular, uh, but it is also one of the seven methods. This is a brief history of the last uh, 30, 40 years. In fact, as early as 1977, people already talk about making things layer by layer. But it's only in 1988 that 3D system sells the world first commercial printer, SLA. I bought it two years later in 1990. And of course, uh, these are all the landmarks. I think I told you about Carbon 3D. Where is Carbon 3D? It's not here. It's one of the biggest breakthrough. Oh, not mentioned here. But anyway, you can see first blood vessel, prosthetic, hearing aid. Quite a lot of uh, very remarkable commercial successes over the last 30 years. Why is 3D printing so popular? There are a lot of advantages. Uh, so this is the part that I brought here. You can take a look later. This is what you call an impeller. Uh, prior to 3D printing, I actually was trained in CNC. So five years, I was doing a lot of CNC post-processing. For an impeller, you need what? You need five axis, right? Three axis cannot cut this. If you know what I mean, uh, you've done CNC before. Your cutter not only do X, Y, Z, you must do A and B in order to reach all these places, right? So for things like that, very tedious. Five axis post-processing is very tedious. I've done it before I started 3D printing. So to do something like this is very simple in 3D printing. I want four, five, I do five. I want double the size, I do five the size. And I do it on the same platform in one go. And that's how I started. In 1990, when I bought a printer for jewelry, I printed all the jewelry rings in one go. I printed 20. I gave to all my girlfriends. But they don't want. You know why? They told me it's plastic. <laughs> so I went to the jewelry company and I asked them to go coat my plastic. So I went back to my girlfriend again, still don't want me. Says, it's plastic inside. <laughs> but today, do you know you can 3D print gold? You can 3D print platinum and silver. Uh, so it can be done as well. So it's reached the stage where even precious metals can be 3D printed. So this is fantastic when you do something like this because you do not need tooling. Which means in machining, you need to do jigs and fixture. You're talking about that, right? You need to hold it because the cutting force is great. In 3D printing, you don't need to do jigs and fixture. Because when you do G and fixture, you design them, you're going to make them, and then before you can actually cut them, right? So it's very troublesome. Here you don't need. That's why less waste and very quick turnaround. So this one example. Freedom in design. It gives you a lot of freedom, and design is important. Actually, electronics, today a lot of things have been done. I'll have a slide later to show you. This in the area of to make sure they are very complicated. I think you also showed me quite a lot of scow this morning, right? In my first trip, China opened up, uh, in, in Gutong Dong invited me, you know. I brought this scow there, you know. I was stopped at the airport. <laughs> they thought, how come I got scow in my bag? So, <laughs> they thought I killed someone. So I decided, no more scow, I don't want to bring anymore. But this is a very nice classic example that was presented at a conference. It was a pair of conjoined twins, they are joined at the head. So this is a very, very serious operation to separate the conjoined twins. They are joined at the head. The key thing are the blood vessels. How do you separate the twins, deciding which blood vessel goes to which twin? It is very, very serious. Uh, typical operation like this takes 92 hours. So to 3D printing where they have the replica, they can then plan ahead of time, rehearse where the blood vessel should go to which twin. They cut it down to only 22 hours, one quarter of time. Save time in operating theater, save cost. Save lives because less risk of open operation. So this is a fantastic example of how 3D printing can be a useful aid for the neurosurgeon. This is my favorite topic now. Every day I talk about food, 3D printed ones. <laughs> okay. 
Later, I'll show you one of the things I have 3D printed. But the whole idea is print on demand. So she comes here for two years. She missed her Xiao Long Pao. Some of your Chinese food at home, what do you do? You don't have to worry. Get a printer from me. Print your food. <laughs> the simplest one is your coffee maker. What do you have? You have a capsule, right? You get a cup of coffee. Same concept. Automation. But the printer gives you a wide range of ingredients that you want to print. If you want multiple print heads, it's possible today, right? Your FTM can have multiple noses. You can do your various French cuisine. <laughs> okay, digital food. That's what I'm pushing for now. This is a classic example. Again, used to be very expensive. Every piece is customized to the human hearing aid. Today, you can get this for only a few dollars. Used to be thousands of dollars. So, mass customization. This is. These are two of my favorites. Uh, I printed this. In fact, very senior CEO may not even know that. This is 3D printed. This whole thing is 3D printed. It has multiple gears. Have you seen this before? I'm sure you have. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how many gears are. There are a lot of gears. Uh. Basically, it's functional. functional. Okay. So you can have a lot of fun with it. When it comes out of the machine, it is all joined. So it takes away the trouble of assembly. You don't need to assemble. It's fully assembled, just like that. Every one of these gear is 5-axis machining. So you can imagine the tremendous saving from making this. If you're, you spend your entire life in machining, you look at this, you will say, wow, this is really amazing, right? So all the gears, all printed in a machine, taken out, and you can use it straight away. This is aluminium. I printed the same thing in titanium, as well as stainless steel. Now. Can you do it for plastics? Yes, you can do the same thing in plastics. This is a mach this is the part that you can do it in your machine. You have a connect here. Uh, this machine is by jetting, so you small little droplets. But because you have multiple print heads, you can have multiple materials. So the color is not added by me after the printing. <laughs> During the process, you can choose different polymers with different color, and it is also fully functional. This is something you will know. Vernier, right? It's for you to measure this. Fully assembled as well. Yeah. So to be fair, I must pass to this side as well. So these are the wonderful things that shows you the savings in time to do all these uh, nice uh, parts. So I, I pass it around. When you have it, you find that all this. I don't know where the mouse is. But anyway. Okay, let me just carry on. By the way, anytime you have a question, just put up your hand. I can just answer. Okay. So today, uh, 3D printing has been used anything. Aerospace, the space is the limit. Practically anything I think of, people have printed it. After 30 odd years, people try to print all kinds of things. What can you expect? Okay, I'm going to use five C's to share with you what are the things you can expect from uh, 3D printing. Now, when I was growing up in Singapore, we all aspire to have to the five C's. These are the five C's, cash, credit card, condo, country, club, and car. You may not have the same aspiration in France. Cars are very expensive in Singapore. <laughs> if you know our prices, you, you, and this is what my manager told me. He said, Prof Chua, your generation is this. My generation is this. But do you notice what is common? What is common? Hassan. You can see what's common between the previous 5C and the 5Cs today. Cash. <laughs> no matter what generation it is, you want cash, right? Correct or not? Who don't want cash? <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't learned how to print cash. Uh. If I learn how to print cash, I won't be standing here. There are also 5Cs in 3D printing, which I'll share with you one by one. The first, and I think the most important, who wants to be a Nobel Prize winner? Go into this. This will be the most impactful because it saves lives. Today, you can see the growth of work in this area is shooting up. And that's why I started the journal in bioprinting. I also wrote a book on bioprinting. Very key. When we started, there was no such thing as bioprinting. We were doing a lot of scaffolds. I told you this morning about cellular structures. That's how it started. But by and large, from scaffolds, people are going to scaffolders, directly printing with the cells. Then came, now bioprinting is the accepted word in Oxford Dictionary. The whole idea is really to produce functional 
tissues and organs. Why? Save lives. What is most important during COVID? What organ? Lungs, yes. Many people die, otherwise they are healthy, just because of the lungs. Uh, I have very sad stories, I don't know about you. My wife's best friend didn't make it to 50 years old. Sportswoman, play many sports very well, but one particular organ was affected by cancer. She lost her life before she reached 50. It's very sad, right? If I can print an organ to replace, I will save her life. So this is something uh, that affects every country. This data may be for USA, but it's the same for Singapore, it's the same for France. People need organs every day, but the transplant you can find is not going to be enough, right? And even if you can find a transplant, there may not be a match. That's why in the 1980s, there was a new concept called tissue engineering. Heard of it? 1980s, about the same time as 3D printing. The whole idea of tissue engineering was to engineer a tissue or organ for replacement instead of waiting for someone to die, which is transplant. So you actually take the cells from the upper, the same person, so there's no chance of rejection. Take your own cells, and then you create the environment to print the ECM, and with that, you can create a healthy tissue and organ. And when you put it into your body, it won't reject because it's your own tissue. This gave birth to tissue engineering. And in the 1990s, 3D printing and tissue engineering kind of come together because then they realized 3D printing is a good manufacturing technique of making the ECM so that you can make tissue or the environment structure that's conducive for your cells to grow, proliferate into the organ that you want. But having said all that, it's not easy. <laughs> it's very challenging. When you print something that looks like a kidney, it just looks like a kidney. You must make it work. That's the difficult part. The functionality. So usually in this field of work, you need a multiple group of people, the biologist, the chemist, the mechanical engineer, and the clinician to get this to work. But if you're excited in this area, this, I think, is the most impactful of the five Cs. The next C I'm going to share about is concrete. So this is a very big area for Singapore. Not sure whether is it big for France. But in Singapore, we suffer from lack of automation in the building and construction industry. We use too, much, too many humans, <laughs> too manual. And therefore, our productivity is very low. We lag behind Japan, US. And the idea was really to use 3D printing, automation, robotics to aid the process of making buildings. So it's a very challenging. This is a piece of work done by my colleagues. Of course, uh, this is a work done in, by a company in China. Uh, so my colleague using robots to do very big stuff. And this is something that I 3D printed in my previous job. It's the bathroom unit that is pretty high. Huh? You can see it's quite high, high up. So it's an entire bathroom unit. So we printed the concrete. The fixture inside, you can just buy and fit in. Like you can buy your toilet bowl, your washing basin, just fit in. But it is that structure that we 3D printed. I want to make a guess how long it takes. Ask the boy. Can you guess how long it takes for the robot? There's a robot behind. Can you see the robot arm? Make a guess how long it takes the robot to print this. Make a guess. You can help him. Hmm? One month, okay. Shorter. Two weeks, shorter. Hmm? Several days, shorter. One day, shorter. How many hours? No, higher, higher. <laughs> okay, to save time, 11 hours. 11 hours. So today, 6 p.m., I go home, I push button. Next morning, I come to work, I have one bathroom unit. Fully automated. It prints for me one bathroom unit. Imagine, you know, how much productivity is safe. You don't need human intervention. The entire, and we actually work with a company. These are guys from the company. The specs came from them, which means we are actually going to commercialize this bathroom unit. So this has been done actually all around the world, but we did this quite, quite a few years ago. Today, I think you will read the news, there are, Many, many parties doing this, building houses and things like that. My third C is copper. Why I choose copper is because copper is a metal that can resist 
corrosion, especially in marine offshore. So this is a propeller used for ship. And to get one of these, to order one of these takes six months. So the idea was, can I print rather than wait for the contract to, you know, to deliver? So this uh, 3D printed. So one of my colleagues is printing this, but it must be regulated. It must be considered safe for use to put in a ship. I, I saw your car just now. Wow, very nice. Okay, we also have done a car. Don't know whether can I play this. So this was our project. When I joined SUTD, I thought it was quite nice to do. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Get ready for the ride. Huh? It's a F1 car. Do I click this? Oh, here it comes. SUT is very small, so we cannot drive too long. <laughs> In a short while, we reach the other end. So this was a student project, just like yours. But we haven't got the body yet. Yours is very nice with the body. Maybe I get your students to do one for me. <laughs> but this was a student work, and uh, we have quite a lot of things 3D printed, and also generative design. We did it for the steering wheel. The steering wheel, we actually use a polyjack. So the part the you hold is soft material. The others, we use rigid. So polyjack can do both. Yeah, multiple. And for the side mirror, we use also generative design. So it comes out really nice, aesthetically nice, at the same time lightweight. So we use AI in our design. Then we did uh, electronics, we did composites, and we also did metal. All the metal joints are printed by SLM. So it was a student project, um, which we are very proud of our students did it. Uh, this one I won't teach you what to do because weapons is no go. But people have printed guns. Uh. Please don't do it. Okay. This one I think you should do, and you should do more, because a lot of things uh, today are restricted by manufacturing. The handphone that you have, do you know inside there's printed circuit board? You know? A 10 layer printed circuit board that is in your handphone will take four to five weeks to do. And they use a machine called lithography, which costs a million bucks in the industry. And the worst of the three things is what? It's flat. <laughs> Now you, why, now you know why your handphone is flat. It's not because human cannot design 3D. It is a machine, lithography, that cannot make 3D. But now there are machines that can do 3D. So you can see this here. We can actually print our electronics on a three-dimensional space. So you have a UAV, you can do your embedded electronics on it. So three-dimensionally, and this is going to change. This is a very exciting area. So, But I notice you don't have any of these printers, do you? Ah, okay. Okay. So this one we use a commercial printer called Automat. So you can actually do electronics. And these are the things we have printed. Printer circuit board, resistor, inductors, microheaters, RFID, and maintainers. But not all electronics can be 3D printed. These are the ones I would call low-hanging fruits can be done. So these are covered in my book. Ah, this is my favorite now. <laughs> food. Nobody thinks about digital food. But do you know almost everything around us is digital from the rocket, right? Uh, Singapore, uh, I think France is famous for the sort system. The sort system, the every part is computer aided design. They use 3D printing, right? Why not food? Why, Hassan? Why not food? Not healthy. <laughs> okay. Your printer is just like your microwave oven. When you go to the kitchen, do you think, is this microwave oven safe? You didn't, right? Food printers can be labelled as food safe, just like your microwave oven. So, safety is no issue. Anything else? Why? Why not? Why can't food be digitised? Why not? Storage. But whether 3D printed or not 3D printed, you you have to worry about the because it's perishable, right? Yeah. But actually you put it in a cartridge or capsule, it will last longer. Only when you print it then it is being used. So you can in fact uh, NASA has done it many years ago. So the whole idea is you go on a long term space travel. When I need food, I 3D print them. So the whole idea of print anywhere when you need them, it's very powerful. Imagine you are in Iceland, you are all in your Eskimo, you know, and you miss your French cuisine. 
All you need is a printer and a recipe. I imagine a future. I hope it will happen before I disappear. Where printers are so affordable, you have one in your kitchen, you have one in your school, because it's so cheap, everybody has it. The food ink will be very cheap because many people are using it. And whenever you want tonight, you know, you want to download your menu in your kitchen, push a few buttons, get your meal. Wow, it's so nice. What do you do? You sell your recipe online. Somebody else buy your food, you become rich. That's the future I'm painting, where digital food becomes commonplace because of affordability. We have to overcome that price issue. If you can, this can be a huge, huge thing. Digital food gives you a lot, a lot of potential benefits. Firstly, manpower costs. In Singapore, it's very expensive. I don't know about France. We are having problems in many, many areas where you just can't find. I think we are losing a lot of chefs. <laughs> so, manpower cost is key. And in Singapore, in the last 10 years, I see many of my favourite food disappearing. You know why? The, the people who work on this food industry for decades, making those of my favourite pastries, but it's all standing many hours on their feet, working behind furnaces, and their second, third generation, they say, uh, Papa, Mama, I, I don't want to work in this area. So you know what happened? We lose the heritage. We lose all this nice, yummy food. Because nobody is producing that many more. So what's the key? Footprinting. <laughs> you preserve the heritage. It's all a recipe, right? And why they don't do it? It's because it's very tedious, standing there for many hours. You know, they go for multiple surgery because they spend hours on their feet for decades. These are the stories I hear in Singapore. I don't know about France. But can we preserve all this so yummy food by digitizing them? And when you digitize them, you can make fantastic food. Think of it. Every, you talk about pizza, right? I'm going to challenge you. I'm talking about voxer. Every single voxer, voxer is with a volume. A little dot is pizza, 2D, right? X and Y, right? When I add the Z dimension, every voxer can be put by your nose. I can decide what I want to do in this three-dimensional structure. Imagine the kind of food you can produce. You cannot imagine, right? <laughs> but it gives you unlimited permutations of food that you cannot do by molding any other ways of cooking, I guarantee you. So this is the power of digitization in this age. And I, I, when I look at what has happened in aerospace, in many other industries, they are so advanced, you know, lattice like structure and all that. It's not done in food, interestingly. But I extrapolate, I say, yeah, it can be done in food. And these are all the things I pretty printed. Um, so, move. <laughs> it's not going to move. So this is one of our food printers that we have. So this is Yen, which is one of my favorite. Uh, this is one of my favorite ingredients. So you look at the picture on the left. This chocolate, printed in a helical way, can create a number of crack points. Mechanical engineering that give you the crunchiness that you cannot make by any other cooking methods, only by 3D printing. This is a lattice structure that has been done in bioprinting in aerospace. It's not done in food. Why not? You can create all kinds of ultimate taste that you want. So you can play with texture, you can play with taste. You, if you are crazy into customization, you want special diet, you are a sportsman or you are a soldier, all this can be done. Okay? Um, I tell you what, I want to make my researcher share about her work. You can just speak from there loud enough. Share about what we are doing in test bathing. Um, yeah, so what we're doing is actually um, finding investments right now um, and trying to spin off the company. Um, so through these investments, we really hope to build a very solid MVP. Uh, such that we go to you know hospitals around Singapore, um, nursing homes, etc., um, to really test bit the idea um, of the real world problem. 
and also trying to solve a real world um, um, issue and hopefully catch on um, in, in um, digitization in Singapore. So uh, thankfully, we have you know quite a lot of government support as well. So that's very helpful for us. Um, in terms of interest that we have uh, gathered so far, it's, it's really quite broad. I would say you know chocolates. Um, we have a very famous chocolatier that had actually approached us, asking us to build. Um, if you guys know Singapore, you know we have certain like the Malayan, the um, certain icons of Singapore. Yeah, so um, things like this, a little bit like chocolate gift boxes. Yeah, so we also go to the other end of the spectrum where we have people asking us about cell-based printing. Are we able to print not the meat, but the scaffolding, right? Um, if you guys in, are into cell-based, you would understand that um, there is quite a bit of limitation in terms of the material built, or at least in Singapore, because it is um, you know, sort of um, um, capitalized by one, one manufacturer itself. So in terms of, for example, making a different um, um, design of fish, um, a fish fillet, that's quite impossible for, for these companies in Singapore. So that's where they have kind of engaged us to um, uh, yeah, their interest with us. So again, it's really very broad, um, from nursing homes to cell base to gift boxes. And that's kind of where we are really figuring out the space um, as we go along. But I guess that's the best part about being in a startup. Um, yeah. So we're actually developing our own printer. We call it Digital Chef 1.0. Uh, it is meant to be the best in the market, the fastest, because one of the big issues we find is people say it's too slow, so we have to make sure it's scalable. Second, of course, we are still looking at the pricing, uh, so it has to be cost effective. I, I brought um, chocolate, <laughs> but I made a big mistake. I checked in my luggage, and you know what happened when you check in your luggage? So my wife is going to kill me. Uh, this was meant to be Wendy. You can see but W, E, and Y has now uh, disappeared. But anyway, take a look. Please don't eat it. Uh. It's, it's meant for display. Uh, it was meant for my wife's birthday. So Wendy with two balloons, yeah. Anyway, she, she has eaten the original stuff. This one is for display. Okay. So um, I think what we are trying to do is very much the commercial arm. We're trying to bring in funds. We're doing two things. One is to develop our own printer which will hopefully be used in nursing homes. Now, we are actually have three very key areas. I'll use S, 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 S. First S is for safety. Our original work was with a hospital seven years ago. The idea was a group of patients suffers from dysphagia. So if they had stroke, they cannot eat the usual food that you and I eat because they will get choked. They need baby food, very soft, very pure type. The problem is in a hospital, if you don't have 3D printed food, it doesn't look appealing. They are not going to eat. So they become malnourished. So they want us to use to print it very aesthetically pleasing. So, and if you use mold, it's always the same shape, very boring. So we thought 3D printing would be a solution. And we are working this from the angle of safety. S, okay, that's the first S. Second S, Victoria talked briefly, is about food security. Another very big thing in Singapore. For a very small nation that relies a lot on imports of food, we are having a vision to meet 30% of our food needs by the year 2030. So this is now a very big area, food security. So I give you a few examples. Cell base. So you have meat, but not grown from the farm. right? You eat your beef steak, it takes a long time from your calf to reach your buffalo or your cow. But the key thing is what? What is the key thing? Carbon. Your carbon footprint. So if you use cell base, you are basically think, taking the cell from the chicken or from a calf. You multiply in your lab. You save for cow, 95% carbon footprint. For chicken, lesser, 15%. So the next time you eat your fingers licking good KFC, it may not come from the chicken farm. It will come from the lab. They are already working on it. It's not news, right? So that is uh, one example of food security. There's, there's another example which we also done in our lab. So we have a project on cult cultivated meat. We have also done cricket. Cricket is a source of protein. So you do not need to consume chicken, you know, all the meats from the usual source. You can actually get protein from plants and insects. So in our lab, we have this cricket flour. We can 3D print into a very nice shape. 
but we won't tell you it's cricket, la, so you eat it. <laughs> you tell you cricket, you probably won't eat it. So protein is a source. So that's another important food security thing that we're doing. The third S, very important. The whole world is talking about it. Make a guess. What is the third S? Sustainability, big, big thing now. So I'll give you four examples we have done. Uh, in Singapore, we eat this tropical fruit called, not durian, uh, jackfruit. Very yummy jackfruit, but the seed we throw away. Actually, the seed has got put, uh, potassium. It has uh, nutrients that you want. So the seed itself, we actually kept it back, upcycled, printed in very nice shapes, and we add it. You roast it, it tastes a bit like chestnut, so it's edible. In Singapore, we have factories that make tofu. You all know what is tofu, right? What is it called in French? Same, tofu. <laughs> okay, easy, tofu. Okay. Tofu in a factory, when they produce a lot, you know the byproducts is what? Anyone knows? What is the byproduct of tofu? Okara. It is a small little thing that they are thrown away. It's a bit like you drink tea. What is your byproduct? Tea leaves. You drink coffee, you get coffee grind, right? These are byproducts which you will throw away. But Okara, we actually three D print. In fact, we published a paper that's on the front page of the journal. So we have done Okara, we have done uh, jackfruit seed, we have done orange peel. In Singapore, Chinese New Year is our tradition to give a pair of oranges. We eat the orange, we throw away the peel. But the peel actually has vitamins, and you can upcycle so it's a bit bitter. So what we do, we print it with chocolate, <laughs> so it can it's edible. So we have done those three. Now my PhD student is doing uh, vegetables. A lot of us eat leafy vegetables, but when it comes to stem and stalks, we throw them away. So we have gotten to the farm to get all this. We are 3D printing them so that we don't throw them away. So this is our effort at sustainability. So there are many, many examples. I'll just give you a few. All those examples can be found in my book. <laughs> okay, homework for you to read. Okay. So 3S. What are the 3S? Safety. Security. Sustainability. Okay, yeah. Later, uh, Prof Chang will set the quiz. <laughs> I finished my five C's by throwing the six C. In fact, uh, before COVID, my good friend in uh, Kaust invited, wanted to invite me because Red Sea is suffering from the climate change, killing the marine eco life. They wanted to 3D print chorus. So I was supposed to go there, then came COVID. The whole thing was abandoned. But they, they actually uh, went on to print chorus, and this is really to promote the marine. And it's not just Red Sea, I think many parts. And <laughs> soon, uh, we will not have fish to eat. <laughs> That's why uh, the cell cultivated meat is important. Like you like unagi, you like salmon, <laughs> all those can be produced. So the global industry growth for 3D printing, you can see, is exponential. That's why I told you PhD students, don't worry, your future is bright because there is huge potential. There's a lot of money to be made. <laughs> okay. uh, why did Singapore want to play in this field? Because we find 3D printing is an enabler. It is used practically in every industry. Yeah. So many industries need 3D printing, aerospace, uh, like the sort systems, all these, they actually need 3D printing. MacTech, very good example, offshore, two and die. So this is a report, annual report, where we focus a lot on advanced manufacturing and 3D printing is a key part of it. So the numbers underline our, the importance of manufacturing. So our, this is our manufacturing performance. Uh, in Singapore, 20% of our e GDP is always central around manufacturing and 3D printing is a big component of it. When I was in NTU, I worked closely with companies. These are the companies I work with, but not all. I'm showing you the big ones, okay? These are very big corporate labs that we work with in. So I'll give you an example. I work with HP. HP, as you know, they have also have a printer, 3D printer called MJF, uh, multi-jet uh, uh, fusion, right? Uh, okay, magic. Do you have it, MJF? You don't have one? Okay, so we have one. So when we work with them, was about Pre-COVID, I think I flew a team to Palo Alto. We discussed three days over 15 projects. They invested, you know how much? You know how much is the whole lab? 84 million. So all these are big investments by company. When company put money on the table, what does it mean? 
It means it's serious business. They want to make money. So I'll give you another example. Uh, nearer to your Evonik, German company that sells, uh, that sells specialist chemicals. But none of the materials at a point of time are used for 3D printing. So why they go into it is because they notice that this is a growth area. If my materials can be used for 3D printing filaments, for example, I have a new growth area. So when they come to you, they actually need your help. So I was their consultant, I helped them map up, and after that, we went into projects. Today, they are already having certain materials. Fo they focus a lot on footwear. They find that this is a very big market for consumer products. So these are, I, if I go through, it will take a long time, but let's give you some examples. The biggest group is still application. In fact, this ultrasound is very interesting. Uh, I have something here so I thought I should show you. Any mothers here? Mother? Any mother here? Okay, uh, ask, lady, uh, ask father also can. Uh. <laughs> what is this? Uh, Prof Chang is a father. What is this? Uh? What is this? Yeah. There's a baby inside here, through outer sound. So actually, this was a project I did with an Iranian researcher. So one day, he, I don't know him, he emailed me, he said, uh, I have a very nice software. I can take ultrasound images, turn them into very nice, but I don't know how to print. Can you print for me? So we printed this, we published a paper in RPJ, Rapid Production Journal. So this is a baby, a fetus, the baby in the mother's womb. Then, of course, out of curiosity, I said, what do you want to print this? Uh? Like you, you say, why well, am I print this? He said, oh, because in Iran, parents want to buy this. They want to show their children. This, this was you in Mama, you know, four months old, five months old, six months old. Souvenir, you know. Funny, right? Would, would French want this? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, but you know, ultrasound, the quality is no good, so you can't see the real features. But it was uh, one of the projects I did many years ago, ultrasound. Anyway, there are too many that I... But these are all real big companies that work with us from America, from uh, Japan, Korea. Okay, so this was a paper I published in Nature during COVID because suddenly I realized, eh, hey, 3D printing is very useful for fighting against COVID. So in fact, I have some here, something you will recognize, but probably you don't use it now. The little boy, do you know what is this? Something you use during COVID. Yeah, and it's a sort. This is printed by your form lab. We printed this. Medical grade, it can be used. So you can use it. So it was very fun for the students because they can design a different thing and they print it. And we actually use this as a solution because during that time, in 2020, the two biggest companies in the world that supply nasal swaps commercially are Northern Italy and USA. Because their countries need the nasal swaps, there was no supply <laughs> to Singapore. So we need immediate solution. We use 3D printing. But of course, it's so slow. So we had two companies to do 3D printing. We also get three more companies to do plastic injection molding. Of course, uh, that one is like mass production. This one is very quick turnaround in terms of design. You do a design next day, you can try out. Yeah. So of course, uh, this is very fun for students. So swaps. Uh, so at the time, I actually put together all the different things that you can do with 3D printing. And then I published a paper in Nature. So it's very nice work. The tomorrow is very bright. If you look at the crystal ball, the money continues to be huge for market opportunity. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about the trends. There are 11 here, but I don't have time to share 11. I'll share two. One of which will be uh, Prof Chan's uh, pack subject, design, design for AM. So design AM is to take advantage of 3D printing. So you want to be able to redesign parts. Many, many commercial systems, products, components are made by other methods. For decades, they have not changed. So you see companies that have these instruments, inside a lot of done by welding, there are a lot, a lot of efficiency there. They want to use 3D printing to take advantage. When you re redesign, you can also make it lightweight. This is very important for aerospace. Most important is you can reduce part count. So a uh, classic example, you told me GE is here, right? I got one. These are some of the parts approved by FAA for aerospace. 
This is an example from GE. So they have this part, they call it a fuel nozzle, has got 18 parts done by different methods, CNC and all that. What did they do? They redesign and they make it in, print it in one part. So actually they, I think they had uh, EOS. They have 30 EOS SLM printers to print. I visited them in Cincinnati. And then oh, they love SLM so much. You know what they did? They invested $2 billion and bought up. They, they couldn't buy it because EOS is too expensive, so they bought the Concept Laser. Yeah. And then they bought Arkham for electronic, uh, electron um, beam. So two different ways of making your metal parts. So they become overnight a top metal vendor, <laughs> not just a user. Okay. I won't have time, I won't show you the video. So nearer home, uh, I train a lot of HP uh, engineers. So they also work with us and they internally have a lot of projects to look at what are the parts that they have in HP that they can do by 3D printing. So this is an example that they did. Originally, it has got uh, five parts, all metals by subtractive, so it's CSC machining. They redesigned it. They use their own printer to print it in one part. No compromise on the structural integrity. In fact, the performance is even better. So cost reduction, weight reduction, five parts become one part, so no assembly, and save time. So this is a local example, redesigned for AM. The next big thing is already here. <laughs> Everybody is talking about check GPT every day. AI is huge. Uh, Prof Chang is really doing quite a fair bit in this area. And uh, generative design is something you do a lot. So you can take a design which is previously like this. And using AI, you can generate many designs that don't compromise on your structural integrity, but you take advantage of weight and time reduction. So this a car has been done also for generative design. Uh, one last word before I move into standards is that AI can also help you not just on design, but even the process. You can optimize your process by machine learning. Uh, you, you collect data, right? data analytics, you can optimize them. So AI can play a big role in AM. Standards is very key. Today, the pace of adoption is very limited by what? Standards. Or the lack of standards. Not enough standards out there. So few. But if you look at the... So ASTM joined force with ISO. If you look at this roadmap, there are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of standards that you can develop. With standards, people is assured. So if I tell you, this LT is 3D printed, the first thing you ask, is it safe or not? <laughs> Otherwise, you run out of the door. So standards are important to assure the user this is safe. Whether it's food, <laughs> LT, aeroplane, I'm going to take one tomorrow. I don't think there's 3D printed part. So important for safety, and standards play a very key role. Today, unfortunately, even though you can develop thousands and thousands of standards, they are only 47, or if, in fact, maybe now over 50. Very few. Why? Because it's very tedious. It takes you generally three years to develop one standard. And I'm sure you have the same standards in France as well. So these are the standards, and mainly driven by aerospace. That's why you see things like aluminium, titanium, things that are used very much in aerospace. Uh, besides active ones, there are a lot of under development, which is uh, closer to 100. Okay. So this ongoing effort, uh, if you are interested in following them, ASTM has got meetings all over the world. In 2019, it was in France. Uh, in 2018, I brought them to Singapore. So they meet uh, twice a year, one time in America, another time the rest of the world. This was the one a few years ago when I brought them to Singapore. This is a conference I organized uh, in 2022. Unfortunately, uh, you couldn't come. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I have organized so far four. This is my fourth conferences. But despite in the middle of COVID, I actually had the best attendance, you know. Most number of keynote speakers, most number of uh, exhibitors, donors, so on and so forth. Yep. Okay, I thought I'll share this. I've organized many 3D printing competitions in my life. This was the tent that I organized two years ago. Have a look at the competition. It's for students nationwide. All the uh, students came and they took part of it. You all watched MasterChef? Have you watched MasterChef? Yeah. This is Singapore's MasterChef with technology. Uh, MasterChef is cooking, right? This one is printing. <laughs> so 
Let's take a look at Master Chef. My main intention for joining this program is to understand more about 3D. This is actually a very novel idea that has a lot of room for experimentation. I recently got a 3D printer of my own. I want to learn more about the combination of technology and food because it's basically a two different world. You have a very beautiful story to your fish. Well done. I was very impressed by the passion and the innovation that was shown by the participants as well. We hope that all the students they will actually bring this back to the schools and share it with other friends. Exploration sessions basically allow us to get a hands-on experience on these 3D printers before the competition itself. That's what really has been quite something that we have enjoyed. We've been slowly but surely improving our pace so that it will be better suited for our design. I think more participants should try to participate in this competition because you learn so much. You, you can see what this was still in the midst of COVID, <laughs> all wearing masks. Yeah, so in 2022, the students came to the campus. It was very nice to see so many people, right, because of all the distancing that we do during COVID. Uh, this was the 10th I've organized in my life, but the hardest. You know why? because the food had to be consumed, right? You talk about safety. So my president was afraid of uh, food poisoning. Is it safe or not? <laughs> so I said, these are all food safe printers, they are safe. Uh, I, I tell you why it was so stressful, because the national television was coming to film. So when we launched the project and the time that the broadcasting station is coming to film, I had 10 days. So I had to train the 78 students in 10 days to come up with something decent because it's going to appear on national television. <laughs> so I had sleepless night. I was so worried. But thankfully, it, it went well. So I, I had sponsors who paid for the printers, paid for the food. And we had two episodes. First, we printed Yam. The second episode, because it was funded by, it was sponsored by Singapore Food Agency, they wanted to work on sustainability. So the second episode, we worked on upcycling vegetable waste. So it's two different topics. So actually, it's a very exciting area. It, it depends on what's your favorite ingredient you can print. Uh, before I forget this, uh, I printed a very nice uh, figurine. In case you like to take this as a business, you can also do this. Very nice. This SLM printed. Yeah, I can print one for you. That look like you. This was my ex-boss. So people ask me why I print him. I say whenever I'm not happy, I'll pin him. No. Yeah, that's joking. That's joking. Please don't tell him. So I, I don't have time to share with you, but this is a, another nationwide competition I did with Dyson. They sponsored, they gave us, they gave us quite a lot of money <laughs> and we did a nationwide competition. So this is the Dyson thing. Our students are involved in Industry 4.0. I teach the 3D printing class and they actually work on a project. The 
the topic came from Dyson. So Dyson wanted to do a musical instrument. This whole thing is FDM printed, like a musical box. Fantastic. The students did a fantastic job. Okay, if you're interested in reading more, these are my papers. <laughs> if you like cell, look at uh, Premier and Organ, why we are not there. If you're interested in metals, you're interested in COVID, you're interested in electronics or food, these are some of my papers. Uh, this is a program uh, more for people to advance their career. Lah. So if you want to do masters, you can come to Singapore to do masters. I will skip them to my last slide. As I promised, I have Line, I have WhatsApp, I have WeChat. <laughs> Almost every social media platform that a professor now must know. Otherwise, students will not respond to you. Feel free to scan the QR code. Uh, if you send me an email, normally I don't reply. No, I'm no, joking. Send me any of the social media, you will get reply within 24 hours. That's the promise I give. All right? Stay in touch. I hope you enjoy my talk. Thank you very much. So thank you. Thank you again for Professor Chai Pai. Uh, very uh, nice Please talk. feel free to ask questions. Um, yeah. I've actually gone to around the world, uh, no joke, I've gone to governments who want to invest in this technology. I help many companies to invest in the technology. I give tons of talks uh, and I'm not charging. <laughs> so I'm here. Any question you want to ask? I have 34 years experience. I hope I can reply you. If not, I will go and check and let you know. Any questions, please feel free to ask. Yeah, feel free. I'm sure you have questions, right? Yes, please. How to make money, right? <laughs> Hello. Yes. So thanks a lot for your outstanding presentation. Thank Very you. interesting. Um, I would like to, to have um, your vision about the, the following thing. Um, we know that uh, 3D printing is, is there are a lot of papers in, in the literature and they often deal with the use of the process. Mm. Um, I think there are less papers dealing with the how the material which is or the structure which is obtained after this process um, is guaranteed with regards to the requirement. That ah. means uh, we are not necessarily sure about how a structure will be strength or will resist to an impact, for example. Mm. So uh, uh, um, uh, maybe a lack of mechanical characterization. What is your vision about that? Okay, so there are big companies that have invested in 3D printing. You don't see it in the out there because they keep it. Like for instance, BMW, they Rolls Royce, they invested lots of money for more than 10 years. And a lot of things they keep in-house. They're not going to share with you. That's why you don't see them in the literature. What you normally see are published by PhD students. <laughs> so a lot of their work is deep science. And they never go down to application because that's not a requirement of PhD. So that's why you don't see that level of um, scrutiny that goes into it. But generally, it has been acknowledged uh, and has been publicized in terms of mechanical properties what is AM superior, what it is inferior. So in terms of mechanical strength, AM is superior. Most of the time, you can get it better. Why? Because you're actually working with a microstructure. So you are able to manipulate and give it. Of course, I'm saying that you also must do heat treatment at the end. It usually will give you better mechanical strength. But it's usually poorer in terms of ductility. So there is always a compromise. So it depends on your requirement. Every company, every user has a unique set of requirements. So you have to talk to the company and find what is it that is important. Do you find one that is good in every? Quite difficult, I would say. But you can work and customize towards the need of the company and you move towards that direction. So I work with companies, let's say Evonik, they were very keen and they're very clear. They want to work for consumer products and they were looking at footwear. So they wanted a material. And footwear, you know, it has to be soft. Like, otherwise, you hurt your feet. So it was very clear what kind of polymer they were looking at. Uh, I worked with um, another one also, materials from Thailand. They are Fortune 500, very big PTT uh, GC, Fortune 500. And their focus was automotive. A bit like here, I saw a lot of like, automotive companies here. 
Same thing in Thailand, they make a lot of automotive uh, cars, and their polymer they were looking at, including composites, were more for automotive application. So you really have to look at the needs of the company or the user. Now, application, usually you don't see that many journal papers, because journal is always focused on the science, right? So it is always a breakthrough. Maybe you have material properties 10 times better than what it is. And there's still a lot of scope. We are very far away. If you ask me my own honest opinion after 34 years, we are only scratching the surface. There are still many things we do not know about 3D printing. It's scary out there. Yeah, you, you look at CNC. The first NC machine was 1951. It took about 50 years before CNC become a commonplace, a machine that's accepted by the shop floor. When you buy a CNC machine, you are guaranteed of the productivity. Everything is there. Uh, any more research, very little in CNC. But 3D printing, we have a long way to go. That's why I told PhD students, don't worry, you are. You will be around for the next 50 years. <laughs> it will still continue to challenge us. There are many things we don't know. 3D printing, you print it, must be this way, right? You know, you, this way and this way, the things change. Even in a powder bed, here and here and here, the properties are different. So there is still very limited understanding of 3D printing. So maybe the, the compared to classical manufacturing process, there is maybe a, a risk of using 3D printer or, or 3D material mm -hmm. for a given application without being sure that it will maybe strength enough for a given application? Correct. So I think you have to find a sweet spot. Now, why two industries have benefited the most? You know which are the two that have benefited the most? Which two? The one that you're in, medical. The other one is aerospace. Why are these two industries investing so much? Do you know why? It's a sweet spot. Firstly, they don't make a million aeroplanes. <laughs> Planes are usually what? Singapore Airlines, when they order 10, 20, and it's highly customized. So the industry must not be millions of you know, things. So, and then medical is even more. The other extreme, right? Knee implant, one of a kind here. One. So small quantity, lot. A lot of customization, and the unit price is very expensive. 3D printing makes an impact. That's why medical and aerospace are the two key ones. And that's why I'm still very poor, because food people don't want to pay. Right, huh, Victoria? <laughs> so I hope to print something that people will be willing to pay, and then we'll be rich. <laughs> so it has to be cost effective. And that's why aerospace and medical are important, because those things that you pay for, they are very expensive. So they can make an impact there. Now, I've hi you know, I highlighted some of the things I don't think 3D printing is a solution for all things. So don't go away thinking, oh, I can do everything. No. So you must sometimes use hybrid. Sometimes you must still go back formative or subtractive. It really depends. So a combination would be the best for your solution. 3D printing is not your all for everything. So you must choose carefully. Okay? I, I hope I've answered you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks. You're most welcome. Any more? Boy, anything? Last question. I hope I have not lost you. <laughs> Any question? Don't worry about the question. Just ask. Don't worry about you know. Yeah, I know pretty strange, actually. Yeah, yeah. Just, just ask. Don't worry. I will use whatever knowledge I have to answer yeah. to the best of my ability. We have so many PhD students uh, working on uh, yeah. ITMF and related topics, actually. So today, I think uh, Professor Tsai uh, yeah, introduced a very nice topic about yeah. digital food, right? Yeah. Yeah. Digitization is the way yeah. to go. Everything will be digitized. Yeah. And once you have digital, you can do anything and everything within your space. And the machine is a machine, right? If you quarrel with your boyfriend, no dinner tonight. But the printer will print for you 10 times out of 10 times the same reliable dish. <laughs> it has no emotion. <laughs> it will give you the same reliability. That's what we want to use the printer for to produce the food for us. So I told the chef, it is not meant to replace you. It is meant to help you, just like AI, right? I hope we don't get replaced by AI. It is to allow you to do higher order. So you have customers at your restaurant, you have a few printers, print the usual thing. You do your high order, creative food, go out. And you charge them, right? Fine dining, pleasure. Pay for the pleasure and delight. High-end dish, but famous chef, right? 
carpenter behind doing the work. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. Yes, uh, you mean uh, food printing? Yeah. I think that uh, it's very important to work on raw materials. Yes. Is it possible to print from the same raw material, uh, carrot and the chocolate, for example? Okay, very good question. All the things you see there are all unique, authentic materials that you eat. So you saw carrot, broccoli, it is the same food that you eat. So when we went to the newspaper, you know, they wrote a big one full page article about us. So the journalist wanted to eat. So we printed the carrot that looks like a small little carrot. He, he ate it. Then he asked me, Prof Cho, how come it tastes like carrot? I said, it's carrot. What do you expect it to turn out to be? So it's actual raw material carrot. But to make it printable, you have to make it in the soft puree form. Otherwise, you cannot be extruded because we're using extrusion. But material extrusion is not the only way to make food. There are many other methods as well. Just that material extrusion is the most common and probably the cheapest way to make food. So you can print chocolate. Chocolate was one of the earliest because they found that chocolate has the right neurological properties. When you heat it, it's very soft. And when you print it, cool it, it's hardened. It gives you the shape that you want. It retains the shape. Not all food retains the shape nice. And not all food is printable. Okay, I've not gone into very technical aspect. But actually, we've done a lot of work. We have a pattern that allows you to mix things in a way to print vegetables. Some of these vegetables are almost impossible to print. You, so you need a mix of uh, commercial food hydrocolloids to make it printable. So there are recipes to do so. So in short, all the materials that you saw just now, they are real stuff. Chicken is chicken, <laughs> fish is fish, uh, potato is potato. So we did not add anything. Unless you need to add food hydrocolloids, which is safe, huh, commercially safe, to make it printable. It will alter the taste a little bit, make it flatter, and usually it's discouraged because it's added expenses. Otherwise, the food that you see here that I showed just now, they are all authentic food that you buy from the market. The only thing right now is it's very tedious to prepare. You have to prepare. You cannot take your carrot and just push it to the printer. It will not work. So you have to mash it up, you know, so that it can be put in. Now, very interesting part is food can be mixed, pre-mixed, or during printing, you can mix them, or you can mix them after. So there are three possible ways. So uh, in Singapore, we have this dessert called chui kueh. Uh, it's, it's a Chiu-Chiu uh, delicacy. So normally, the rice flour is at the bottom, semi spherical because they use a mold. And up there, they put the chai po, radish. So normally, that's the way we recognize it, eat it. But in 3D printing, it doesn't have to be that shape. So my researcher mixed the two and he printed out Mickey Mouse. <laughs> I tell you this Mickey Mouse tree quick. So some of the traditional things that you have in France is always that shape because maybe they use more, right? What must it be that shape? It may not be. So aesthetics give you a very powerful instrument. So Victoria test bathed with the nursing home um, um, people who stay there. We gave them three uh, carbo, proteins and vitamins. They add and they love the meal. They like it so much that they finish everything. I think 9 out of 10. It proves one thing. Aesthetics is important. The taste is still the same because it's the same food. But because they like it, they eat it, they are not undernourished. They are nicely uh, happy about it. The only thing we haven't solved the problem is the money. <laughs> the cost is important. Haven't solved yet. Yeah. I hope I've answered your question. Mm. So it's, it's nothing uh, that we play with the material. It's the thing that you buy from the Supermarket. You know, yeah. Yes. The cost. Yes. Uh, so, do you uh, did you compile the cost of the printed food and the original food? Oh yes, yes. Because we actually approached a commercial firm. This guy is a top businessman. He owns a lot of nursing home in Singapore, Malaysia, and China. So, he was very excited when I spoke to him. Then he came, he brought his son, his daughter, his family owned business. Then, uh, businessman, you know what is a businessman? The first thing they ask is the cost. So, when we told him the cost, he said, not doable. Because the problem with nursing home is that, do you know who pays for the nursing home? Not the person. You know who pays? The children. <laughs> so, the children are not going to pay three times the cost, right? So, so if your dad is, is in their nursing home, it's the son who pays. 
you ask the son to pay three times the cost, let's say three dollars or three euros, now you ask him to pay nine euros, he's not going to pay nine euros because to him he's still eating the, <laughs> the food. Yeah. So today for us, the cost is still a problem. I think it's two or three times the cost. Right, eh, Victoria? It's about two or three times more. But we are trying to work on it. The problem is economies of scale because not many people are buying it. Think of the day where almost printer is like, like 30 years ago, we never imagined printer to be so cheap. I bought my first printer was half a million dollars, right? Who would know that today a printer is only a few hundred dollars, right? Because the price will come down. Once the price come down, more people will use it. The material will also come down. And once all this come down, it means that it's more affordable. And then people can play with it. There will be more application. I hope the day will come for food as well. And I'm hoping it will come before I retire. <laughs> so that I see it happening. My vision is this, that it becomes commonplace, that being a scientist, I'm able to come up a function. My function, I call it Chua Index. <laughs> Named after my surname, I call it Chang Index. So it's a function of four things. From the eye, is aesthetics. From the nose, is aroma. So it's, it's aesthetic, it's aromatic. And the A for mouth is hmm? appetizing. I'm trying to use A, yeah? But the most important is here. A lot of yummy food, I don't know in France, but in Singapore, a lot of yummy food are not healthy. Right? Either too salty or too oily. So I'm hoping to create a class of food that is nice, make all this, at the same time, it is healthy. It gives you the nutritional needs. And in fact, another big area is now, can I put medication inside? It's doable as well. So if I can, as a scientist, quantify all this, I can create a choice index that make out these four factors. And everything is push button. I want 0 0.8 aesthetic, 0 0.6 aromatic, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm painting a future which I hope will happen one day. I, I, it hasn't come yet. But you think a coffee maker is really quite commonplace, right? You think 30 years ago people say, hey, uh, 3D printing is so expensive. You go back to 50 years ago, computer, right? Every computer was huge, bulky and expensive. People were asked to look in the crystal ball. How many computers would there be in the world? I say maybe about five. You know how wrong the person is, right? Because it becomes so small, micro computer, and now your handphone is a computer. Things will move. And in fact, it will accelerate, not just move. And price will come down. It will be overtaken. Mark my words. Food printing will come. Join me before it. <laughs> okay. So I hope you find investments for me. I'll come back again. <laughs> we hope to make this uh, a, a reality. Yeah. Today is, is unfortunately still not yet. It's very exciting, really, if you can play with the various voxel. Okay, uh, not pixel. Uh, go voxel. Who is doing pixel? You are doing pixel, is it? <laughs> voxel. Uh. <laughs> ah, okay. Ah, do voxel by voxel for food, okay? We partner. <laughs> then we can make yummy French food, French cuisine. We open a restaurant here. <laughs> yes. Hi, uh, I have two questions. Sure. Uh, first is, uh, I love, I really love a plate, a dish, a dish from okay. Singapore, I think. Oh, is you like from Singapore? Yeah, from Malaysia, is it? Yeah, from Malaysia, but I think it's from Singapore. It's better Singapore, I think. It's a bakute. Oh, bakute, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know if there is uh, the food with soup you can print, 3D print it or not. Oh, with soup? Have uh? you tried it before? Because uh, bakute, I think, is a plate that meet the four things you said before. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. The edity, yeah, the yeah. aroma. So one of the dishes I usually order online when I travel in Singapore and is bakute. Uh, uh, for, for them, they may not know what bakute is. It's basically pork ribs, right? Yeah. It's pork ribs. What is special is actually the soup. It has the kind of spice that make it very yummy. A lot of, I know the Taiwanese, they love bakute when they come to Singapore. Ah, you come, I bring you, go and eat. So, so, but uh, the key thing is actually the, the spice. That's why when Kentucky Fried Chicken, they went into bioprinting their chicken nuggets. You know, they are using a technology, cell-based, to make the chicken nuggets. But what is famous about KFC is still the spices. They will still use their spices. So when you are eating it, you can't tell whether it's from the chicken farm or from the lab. It's still chicken. <laughs> okay. So... Bakute we have not done, but we have done uh, on day on day since you are from the part of the world, you may know it's a Paranakan food. 
we done chui kueh, we done oni, which is another delicacy. So there are a lot of those nice little things uh, we can do together. Maybe you can send your French students over. I, I, I provide you the printers, then you create some dishes. You can send this boy over, then I give you a project you work on, something nice. Try to make sure you can sell, then we'll be rich. Yeah, you can play with it. I had a group of seven Taiwanese students. They came in two months. They created a few nice dishes, unique Taiwanese snacks. Yeah, but uh, I haven't ri become rich. Not yet, lah. So we must create a bus. People were willing to pay three times the usual that you, you know, they buy. Then we have uh, what about the card? A bestseller <laughs> snack. Yeah. So exciting because I think if you can design it, you know, you can cut it, you can drive the printer. And if we know how to play with the taste and texture, we probably have something that people want and willing to pay. I always feel that food people are willing to pay. You agree? When people like a certain dish, I don't know about here. In Singapore, we have hawker centers. You know, right? In Singapore, right? Food court. There are many stores. So when you walk into a food court, you know where are the best food, right? Those with very long queue. <laughs> Must be the best food, right? Yeah. People are willing to. They don't mind queuing for half an hour. Don't mind paying through their nose because they like that dish. Yeah. So I think 3D printing has a good chance. What's your second question? Sorry. Yeah, my second question is uh, what do you think about the other the, the other industry that can go along with the three D printing? Like uh, mm. what is the limit from from now and the reality, the the your dream? Uh, be beside of the technical things, the research, the and the standards. Beside that, uh, what do you think? Okay, uh, actually, one of the biggest area I say the most impactful is cells, but it's the hardest because when you print a tissue, uh, an organ, let's say it's hard tissue, then it's okay. Mm. Bye bye. You can just put it there. Yeah. If you buy, uh, if you print a heart, then it has to perform as a hard tissue. It cannot perform as a kidney tissue. So the function is important. Today, the five major organs are very different. You know why? Because of the resolution problem. A lot of our major organs has got very small capillaries. All these blood vessels are there because you need oxygen to come in, you need your waste to go out. How small they are, they are very small, the capillaries. And today is a challenge for us to make vascularization a reality. But would it come the day where we can print really small, I think it's a matter of time. We will come up with right nano, <laughs> so micro. You go in that direction, you can print real small capillaries. You can make major organs a success, and you will get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> it's a very challenging area, but that's an area where everybody's looking up to get a functional organ. So if if you can only choose one area to go into, I think cell printing will be very very impactful, but of course very challenging as well. If you like food, then you join me. <laughs> I, I still feel it's very exciting because of the potential. I see what is developing in other industries. I translate them. I think it will have a lot of potential in food. Mm. Any more other questions? Some other questions? If no questions, so maybe I uh, put some questions to conclude. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah, so um, uh, the footprint is very nice. and. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, you mentioned about your preparation yeah. and the printing is the most on the physical side. But usually when we uh, print, there is chemical process. Yes. So this chemical process, for example, will change the flavor, the shape, and everything. So mm. how to ensure this kind of, so have ever investigated in this kind of level? Okay. So I, I think uh, printing in the lab and printing at the workplace uh, are two different things. You are right. So for instance, I think, uh, Victoria, you I mean your help here. So when we were doing with the society for the aged sick, they allow us to print in the lab and bring it down. But now we are working with uh, Econ Healthcare, which is a commercial firm. They want us to print there. So we actually have to bring our printer there because they have certain standards, safety standards. So it is more for safety rather than the taste. So we have to go be there and then they have to be assured that it's safe within their environment because they have standards of safety. So they have to look at the things that we use. Because sometimes it's not the printer, sometimes it's the preparation. Right? You can contaminate your food. Yeah. Right? So it's the hygiene part, the preparation. So it's not the fault of the printer. 
So even when I did the competition, I did test the bacteria before and after printing to sh confirm myself that the printer is really safe. It doesn't bring any bacteria. So preparation is also important. For food, it's always challenging because of the expiry date. So when we print it there, they can actually quickly give it to the folks to eat and consume there. We cannot take too long to, to deliver. Yeah. So, so there are challenges. Um, but I think with challenges, there are also opportunities uh, that we can solve. If you can come up with solutions, I think there will be a good place for commercialization. So think about it. There are still a lot of problems. I said like, it's very easy, but it's actually not easy. There are a lot of problems, especially the preparation part. It's a lot of very tedious work. They spend a lot of time to prepare the material. And if we can have gadgets or automation that can help the preparation of the material, it will save us a lot of time and effort. Yeah, yeah exactly. So uh, yeah, last question we perhaps uh, to conclude. Yeah, we can add many additives, right? Yeah. Yeah, to the <laughs> raw material. Yeah. Uh, have you ever imagined that if we add some customized medicine inside the print? Yes, I think yes. It will be a big problem. Yeah, we have correct, to correct. investigate the chemical process, the yeah. reaction, and also, yeah, if customized food or customized food with medicines, mm -hmm. I think the certification qualification will be a big issue, right? Yeah, so there, there, are few, there are a few things that you can go because the pharmaceutical area is very big. Um, actually, I worked on this about 20 years ago. You, you probably heard of this thing called DDD, drug delivery device where you have almost like a pill, but you've got polymer outside, and when they dissolve in the body, you release the drugs. And you can control the release. It is meant for patients who are disciplined or incapable of eating medicine at regular. So you actually implant it. Every six hours, they dissolve, they release the drug into the body. I actually use SLS to do that. But uh, last year, there was an interest was because there are certain patients who just don't like to take medication. So can I actually instead of asking him to eat the pill, yeah, yeah. you know, make the pill into powder form, put it into the chocolate, <laughs> <laughs> and they eat it. So it's more for compliance. No issue there because you are not coming on new drugs. You are just using the medication that he or she has to eat. But you make it in a form that is mixed with the vegetables or chocolate or something that the person likes. And you don't tell him or her. <laughs> you just eat it because they can't tell. Right? So is it doable? Yes, it's doable. Have we done? We have not done it because there's still no request. Last year, there was an interest from a very big pharmaceutical company. They like what we are doing. Unfortunately, we did not win that contest because if we had them, we have to send one of our guys to New York, spend one year under there to look into commercialization. It's somewhat an accelerated program. Yeah, so we didn't win, unfortunately. But I think that's another possible application, adding drugs. Um, at a separate topic, we were in Amsterdam last March. We visited... Um, uh, Wageningen and this uh, TU Eindhoven and TNO, they also have uh, developed a printer that do tablets. So they are doing production already. So it's quite advanced in this area. Yeah. So there are a lot of developments around the world. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. I hope so that helps. Yeah. So I think uh, yeah, and the design for this food printing process will be more interesting because yeah, the parameters and also the box based design. Yes, yes. In fact, we just received another grant this year. One of my colleagues work on AI. So he can use AI to dramatically come up with very nice food design. Yeah. But then it's all graphics. So he came to see me and then we put out a proposal. We got some money. So now his idea is to make the design process very simple using AI. So that it's not very tedious, right? You got to go cat and you design. You waste a lot of time, right? Is there any way where you can use text you just speak what you want in your food and then the AI will turn it into a 3D design that is able to drive the printer to print it according to your design. Yeah. We are working on that. No results yet. I will let you know next year. <laughs> okay. So AI, I think, will be key for us to do the design, to simplify the process. Yeah. yeah actually, we are also working on that. It's what we said, design automation. Yeah. yeah. To use uh, yeah, text, text uh, description. Correct, and correct. It's like requirements, something and we Yeah, maybe we can learn from each other. Three yeah. D, three D, uh, not only 3D mode, for, for my interest is direct generate processing mode. Yes, yes. yes. I, I saw a lot of your work, very nice. Maybe yeah. we can work together on some of these things, yeah. really to simplify. Hopefully, yeah, we will. Yeah, yeah from design to reality in a very fast way. That's like yeah. why you want to skip the process, right? You actually have a CT scan, why do you want to go through to 3D and do STL slicing and all that? Yeah. Just skip, you know. 
So I think uh, simplifying the process chain is important as well. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I hope you have enjoyed my talk. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank, thanks okay, for coming. No questions, so uh, yeah. yeah. Anytime you have a question after you go back, just text me. I'm on WhatsApp, I'm on WeChat, I'm online, I'm Telegram, Instagram. So just send me and uh, well, we can become friends. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Again. Yeah, thank, you thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So uh, perhaps in the, in the next time we will build some collaboration, China, and uh, we can have uh, mobility, yeah, between each other. Actually.